Welcome back to our series of videos addressing arches. In this particular video, we're going to explore what the funicular shape is and how we determine it under a primary load. And in this case, we're going to do analytic form finding as opposed to experimental or graphic form finding. We would like to know what shape the top cord should have to assure that the top cord will act in pure compression with no tendency to bend. As an alternate way of asking the question, we can shape the top cord in such a manner that there is no force in the web members. Here we've actually included web members, but um, we'd like to understand how this would work if those web members weren't even there. We call this shape the funicular shape under the primary load, which in this case we are considering to be a uniform load distributed along the horizontal. That uniform load has been gathered together, so all the load between there and there has been concentrated on this joint, and all the load between here and here has been concentrated on that joint. And then this half a bay of load has been put at the support point in the form of a half a P force. Presumably we will know the span from our design situation. We as the designers would make that decision. For the, for the moment we're just going to assume we want to span 120 feet. Our guidelines for spans and proportions tell us that the depth of a bow truss should be in the range of the span over 10 at the shallow end to the span over 6 at the deep end of proportions. Taking the deep end of the proportions, we'll take the span of 120 feet and divide by 6, and we get 20 feet for the depth of the truss, or as an arch, we would call this the rise of the arch. <clears throat> it is pretty common to make the width of each bay about the same as the depth of the truss. So we'll make the, the width of the bays 20 feet. This tells the location of all the joints except for B, C, E, and F, where we don't know the vertical coordinates of those joints. But that's what we will need to know in order to determine the shape of the top cord. The coordinate system within, within which we are going to develop the equation that will describe the geometry of the top cord of the truss can be located anywhere we like, but because of the symmetry of the truss, it certainly seems logical to locate the coordinate system somewhere along the symmetry line. We have a choice anywhere along that line. We could put it here. We could put it up there. We're going to put it wherever we'll make the mathematics simpler to deal with. So we would like to describe whatever this shape of this top portion of the structure is. And probably the simplest place to put our coordinate system is right there. Because if we put it down here, we're going to have some kind of offset constant um, to account for the fact that this top cord is elevated up at that point. We can always derive this equation and then we can alter the equation by moving the coordinate system around if that suits our convenience. But for right now we're going to put the coordinate system up here. And that means all the top cord coordinates for the Y are going to be negative and that doesn't really bother us because um, it's a completely arbitrary thing, but we're going to stick with our convention that Y is up. And all those decisions will make the mathematics a lot easier to deal with. <clears throat> so now we're going to draw the bow truss again, but you'll notice all the web members have been dashed out. And we've done that because we've said one way of asking the question is how do we shape this top cord so that there is no force in the web members? So we want to express 
the lack of importance of these web members uh, by saying they are basically zero force members and we're going to dash them out. Now we're going to take half of this truss and focus on it because we know the whole thing is symmetric and <clears throat> this is a good way to get started because we need to know some of the internal forces before we can move forward. So we have taken the right hand side of the truss as our free body and we have removed or dispensed with the left hand side <clears throat> but we do have to replace the left hand side with its effects so we suspect since there's a support point here and there was a support point at the other end of the truss we probably have tension in this bottom cord so we're going to put a horizontal tension force here we're not going to put any vertical force because the portion of the truss that we set aside is not capable of exerting a vertical force. But also we've said these two web members are zero force members. So there is under this loading condition, no vertical force at that joint uh, that we have to deal with. At the top joint, we expect to have a compressive force. Um, and in fact, when we look at this, we have no horizontal forces on this structure at all, except this tension force. So this horizontal force, the compressive force at the top, has to be there to balance the one at the bottom. Now, the portion of the truss that we threw away has a sloping member, which presumably can produce both a vertical and a horizontal component. And in fact, it's going to produce this compression force and whatever vertical force goes there, we're going to draw that vertical forces upward consistent with our convention of let's just draw it in the positive direction and uh, solve the equations and let the chips fall where they may in terms of whether that force is actually up or down. So now we're going to take some moments about point D. So this is point D right here. C goes through that joint and so does V, so they don't enter the equations. Furthermore, there's a 1P force on that joint that goes through that location, so it contributes nothing to the moment either. So when we write the equation, we see we have a 1P force here, which is tending to produce clockwise rotation, so we're going to put plus P and this was supposed to be an uppercase P right there. So we're going to start again. This 1P force, which is producing a clockwise moment about joint D, has a lever arm of 20 feet. If we draw the uh, line of action of this 1P force and figure out the shortest distance over to there, that lever arm is 20. So we have plus P times 20 feet. Here we have another 1P force, which is also tending to be clockwise. So we have a plus sign. That 1P force has a lever arm of 40 feet. And then we have a 0.5P force, which has a lever arm of 60 feet. And it's also tending to produce a clockwise moment. So we uh, account for that with a plus 0.5P times 60 foot moment. And then we have this 3P force, which is tending to produce a counterclockwise movement about point D. So we're going to say minus for counterclockwise. It's a 3P force, so we write that in. And its lever arm for action about point D is 60 feet. And then finally we have T, which is tending to produce a clockwise moment about D, so we put plus T times its lever arm, which is the depth of the truss, which we set at 20 feet. So we can divide both sides of this equation by 20 feet, and it simplifies down to this factor now becomes one, that factor is two, that factor is three, and that factor is three. Um, <clears throat> And this factor becomes 1. <clears throat> so we solve for t, and t comes out to be plus 4.5p.
There are only two horizontal forces, as we mentioned before, C and T, and they must be equal and opposite in magnitude. We drew C in the opposite direction. T we drew that way, and we got a plus sign, which means, yes, it is in that direction. And so now we have to say, yes, C is actually in the direction that we've stated um, by drawing this arrow. And therefore, C is going to be in the correct direction as drawn, and it's going to be equal in magnitude to the tensile force, but opposite in direction. So that's expressed now with this 4.5p force right there and the 4.5p force right there. So now we're going to sum the vertical forces to determine V. And we've got uh, minus 3p here, which are going to balance this upward 3p force. So those all disappear. And the only force left is a downward force of 0 0.5. So there's one downward force of 0.5p, so V must be an upward force. So it is in the direction that we drew it in, and we're going to say, therefore, it's plus 0.5p, um, the plus meaning it's in the upward vertical direction. Now we're going to apply the principles of equilibrium to joint J. which is right here, this joint. There's a force to the left on that joint due to the part of the truss that we removed. This member must be pulling on that joint to the right in order to keep that joint in equilibrium, which means this member is pulling on that joint with a force of 4.5p in opposition to this 4.5p force. If this member is pulling on the joint, then the joint must be pulling back on this member, which means the member's in tension. The fact that it's in tension means it must be pulling on this joint on the other end, or the, a more detailed way of saying it is, if this is being pulled to the left by joint J, it has to be pulled to the right by uh, joint K in order to be in equilibrium. If it's being pulled to the right by joint K, then it must be pulling to the left by action-reaction pairs. It must be pulling to the left on joint K. So I'm not going to dwell on this because you've been through this in a number of situations. What you will discover, though, is every time we cross one of these joints, life is really simple because we have no web forces to account for. We started off with the assumption of let's figure out if this whole thing will work without those web forces. So in every case, um, we, we pass a joint here on the bottom cord and nothing happens except we pass through the horizontal force because there's nothing else happening at the joints. So joint K has a force to the left on it. That means it must have a force to the right that's being exerted by this member. And then we go through and apply the same argument here and what we're discovering is nothing is happening at these joints because the web forces are all zero. So basically this 4.5p tensile force is being transferred all the way through to joint G. So it's at joint G that things start to get a little more interesting. Uh, first we're going to apply the principle of the horizontal forces having to be equal to zero on joint G. So in order for G to be in equilibrium, the sum of the horizontal forces must be zero. Now we have a 4.5 P force to the left due to this member right here. That means this member must be pushing to the right on joint G in order to keep it in equilibrium. And in fact, the component, the horizontal component, has to be 4.5p. Now, there are two other applied forces here, or the applied force of 0.5p down and the reactive force of 3p up. So those two are producing a net upward force of 2.5p, which means this member, Fg, must be pushing down 
with a 2.5p force in order to keep joint G in equilibrium. So here we've drawn the arrow down on the joint, which means the joint is pushing up on the member, which is causing compression in that member. That member goes into compression and pushes upward on this joint, F. So when we go to joint F, we see two things happening. One is we had a force here upward on F, uh, to the left, excuse me, of 4.5p to the left on joint F. That means this member must be pushing to the right on joint F with a force of 4.5p on the horizontal. That means this member is in compression. Um, it must also be pushing down on this joint because we have a 2.5p upward force due to this component and we have a 1p downward force so there's a net upward force of one and a half p between this force and this component so this member must be pushing down on this joint with a component of one and a half p so this member is in compression. It has a horizontal component of 4.5, a vertical component of 1.5, and those are the forces that are being exerted on joint E. When we go to joint E, we see there's a 1.5 P upward force due to the effect of this member. There's a 1 P downward force which leaves a net upward force of 0.5p. This member then has to be pushing down and to the right, and its vertical component has to be 0.5p in order for that joint to be in equilibrium. Again, our horizontal forces just pass through because there are no web forces changing anything. The vertical force changes because of this force component, the 1p force. But there's no change in the horizontal component because there's no horizontal force on that joint other than the horizontal component of this member and the horizontal component of that member. And then finally, all that gets passed through up to this joint. And when we get to this joint, we're going to feel pretty good at this point because we have a 0.5p upward force here, a 0.5p upward force there, and a 1p downward force, which means vertically this joint D is in equilibrium. Furthermore, we have a 4.5 force due to this C, and we have a 4.5 horizontal component due to the force of this member on joint D. And as a consequence, those two horizontal forces sum to zero, and we say joint D is in equilibrium. So we've gone all the way around the loop on this thing, and we brought it to closure, and we find consistency. And we were able to do this, by the way. We did all this without ever having a force in one of these web members. So this is basically telling us that the web members have no structural role except possibly to keep these joints in equilibrium so they don't wander off of wherever it is that they're supposed to be. All right, so I'm summarizing all of this in this drawing, um, which is not exactly a good shape. Um, this was a better shape because we have about the right slopes to all these members, but to help us record data, I've sort of redrawn this in a warped way where we have a decent space to put 0.5 and 1.5 and 2 and so forth. So this is a summary of what we just did. Now, here's the key point. We have always said that the forces in a two-force member have to be along the member. So for this member down here, for example, in tension, it's a horizontal member and these forces have to be horizontal. This is a slope member and the forces within that member and the forces it's exerting all have to be at the same slope as that member. So that's the geometric argument that's going to allow us to decide where these joints have to be.
And this is how we're going to do that. <clears throat> we're going to do it by similar triangles. Here we have 0.5p and 4.5p as the components of the force. Here we have 20 feet as the bottom edge of this triangle. And then the unknown, which is what we want to get at, is delta y1 because that's going to tell us how far in the negative direction. Remember, this is y equals 0. Delta y1 is going to tell us how far in the negative direction this uh, joint is located. So the key thing is the force must have the same slope as the slope of the member. And we can use similar triangles between this triangle, which is the force triangle, and this triangle, which is the dimensional or spatial triangle. So for member DE, the slope of one triangle is delta Y1 over 20. And the slope for the force triangle is 0.5p over 4.5p. And when we solve this equation, we get delta Y1 is 0.5p over 4.5p times 20 feet, which is 2.22 feet. So we would go down here and write that in this cell. <clears throat> we're going to do a similar calculation here to get delta y2, which we're going to put there, and then delta y3. <clears throat> now the important thing is, in our formula, we really want to know how far these points are below the origin of the coordinate system. So delta y1 gets us to this point. To get to this point, though, we have to add delta y1 and delta y2. And to get down to this point, we have to add delta y1, delta y2, and delta y3. So here for y, I'm saying that the coordinate of joint E is going to be negative delta y1. The coordinate of joint F relative to this origin is minus delta y1 minus delta y2. And likewise, the coordinate of this joint is minus delta y1 minus delta y2 minus delta y3. So once we have these numbers in our spreadsheet, we're going to add these things together, and that's going to give the, uh, the, the net y values for each of these coordinates. And by the way, when we get down here, it better say minus 20 because we, we agreed when we started all this that, that the depth of our bow truss was 20 feet. So <clears throat> we then can ask ourselves, does this fit a parabola? So a parabola would be y equals kx squared. So we can shift that around and say, well, okay, if it's a parabola, what is the constant k? So if we say we're going to take all of our y values and we're going to divide, we're going to divide by x squared, that'll give us a k value for whatever parabola represents every one of those points. And if all those k values are the same, we will argue that every one of those points is on the same parabola. So we're going to come here. We're going to run these numbers. We get 2.22 feet, as we said, for delta y1, 6.67 feet for delta y2, 11.11 feet for delta y3. And then when we add all these numbers together, these are the coordinates that we get. This is the coordinate for joint E. This is the Y coordinate for joint F. And the G coordinate for uh, the, the Y coordinate for G. And it came out to be minus 20. And then we breathe another sigh of relief because we say, well, that's really good. Because if we come out with something other than 20, we'd be very confused at this point. <clears throat> now, when I say uh, I calculate a k for the parabola for each one of these points as y over x squared, we get 0 0.00555 or 0 0.00556. And this is just round off error. We basically, we need to keep more decimals here if we wanted this to be more accurate. But all those are coming out essentially the same. 
which means we have one parabola for which the constant of proportionality is essentially 0.00555 or 56 or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so we have proven that as long as we put all the points of the top chord on a parabola, we can make it work as the perfect funicular shape and there will be no force in the web members. And ultimately, if we wanted to do an arch, we would use this analysis to figure out what the shape of the arch is. So this is the final shape. And it kind of makes sense. The vertical component here is two and a half, one and a half, and a half. And all those points lie on a parabola. And by the way, that's a way of thinking about a parabola is you could get the slope of these things by saying, well, the slope of this has to correspond to a half a P force. And then we're going to add another increment of one P to get the slope here, another increment there, and so forth. So that concludes our video on exploring the funicular shape for an arch or the top chord of a bow truss under the primary load using the analytic form-finding method.